I'm going to get started here. Actually, why don't you plug in, if you don't mind, I could, we'll just use a tab of your computer. Um, so welcome to uh, the March edition of Ember MYC, March 2018. Um, glad to have you all out tonight, uh, and uh, especially excited to have um, Ed down from Boston. Thanks, thanks for coming down. Um, we are, there'll be plenty of time to applaud for Ed later, it's okay. Um, so uh, a, a bunch of people in the room are um, fresh uh, off of EmberConf. Um, thanks for coming out after uh, multiple days, if not a week of Ember uh, in Portland. Um, just by a quick show of hands, who made it out to Portland? Awesome, cool. Good times? Yeah, awesome. Um, cool, so I want to um, start off by thanking our sponsors. Um, after I do that, I'm going to make a couple of quick announcements uh, and then open up the floor to anybody here who has announcements. Um, so you can be thinking about that. Um, so, but first off, first and foremost, I want to thank Movable Link for hosting us again um, this month. Um, we're here, so you can see it. Uh, the, um, the food, the drink, the uh, generosity is much appreciated. So thank you to all the Movable Linkers in the room, Michael, Spencer, Zach, all, all, everybody else. Uh, for Movable Link, round of applause for them. <laughs> cool. Um, a second, I will uh, take the opportunity of having the mic in my hand to plug um, Yap, my company as a sponsor, uh, who is also hiring right now. Um, and so um, it, it's a, a remote position. So if you're here but not from New York, that's cool. Um, Ember Rails, uh, native mobile stuff, uh, a lot of fun. See me if you're interested in that. Um, and uh, we are running a raffle tonight. So you can see the um, exciting gifts here at the front table. Um, Gemma, do you want to tell the folks some of what we have to raffle off tonight? Gemma is there our raffle administrator. Um, here we have a backpack, and there's a Zoe plush toy. And what's this one? A Tomster mug. Um, what should I call it? Bobble waist, Tomster and Zoe figurines. A pins and what else? What do we call this thing? I don't know. Anybody know what we call this? Mason jar. A mason jar. With the handle. With the handle. <laughs> <laughs> and what should I call uh, this? And the build Tomsters. Build Tomster. Cool. Um, so if you want a chance to win that raffle. Um, Yes, good job, Gem. Um, if you want a chance to win that raffle, make sure that Gemma has um, your name on a piece of paper, she's, she's got a pad, um, before the end of the second talk, okay? So if you just walked in, you know who you are, make sure you're in there. Um, uh, with that, uh, can you, do you mind pulling up um, uh, Emberfest? Cool, so Emberfest, uh, why are we not, there we go. So Emberfest, uh, dates have and locations have been announced. Um, Emberfest is the European International Ember Conference. Uh, this year it's gonna be in Amsterdam, October 11th and 12th. The CFP is open. Um, I believe the tickets are on sale as, as well, I'm not sure about that, but the CFP is definitely open. Um, so uh, I know, I have not yet been to Emberfest, but um, I hear it's an awesome time. And I know some folks from New York have made it in the past, so um, something to check out. For sure, uh, I have one more announcement from uh, the learning team, and that is that um, if you have been following the Ember JS Times, I believe it's called, it's a, a newsletter, the email newsletter that the learning team puts out, um, and it, you should A, subscribe if you don't, don't get that already. Um, but if you've been following it, you'll notice that they've been having a feature called Ask Ember Core. Um, where they take essentially a reader question and get somebody from the Ember Core team to answer it in depth. Um, and so um, Dan Gephardt did a, an excellent one recently. Um, if you have some ideas for something that you'd like to see answered there, um, the learning team has asked me to share um, bit.ly slash ask-ember-core. Um, we'll get you to the form where you can submit that question. Um, so uh, if there's anything that you uh, wished for kind of an official in-depth word uh, from what the status of this idea is in, in the Ember ecosystem, um, that is a good place to ask. 
And uh, with that, I will open up the floor to any announcements from anybody else. Do you have anything that they'd like to share? Come on up, so it's awesome. Yeah, come, come up front. You should get it, get on the live stream. <laughs> <laughs> The graceful Spencer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, we are, in fact, hiring Immovable Inc. So if uh, you're looking or have any questions or are interested, uh, please see me or anybody uh, at Immovable Inc. Thanks. Awesome. Um, cool. With that, I'll, we'll introduce our first speaker. Um, this uh, gentleman is uh, Aaron Sykes. He's worked on a, a bunch of cool projects and has led a project night in the past for us um, on Cardstack. Uh, tonight he's here to talk to us about Ember Quest issues. So take it away, Aaron. Uh, thanks. So um, Quest issues are something that uh, <clears throat> various people, you know, working on Ember have been putting together lately. I think they're really cool. Um, a, a lot of times the hardest part of a software project is figuring out what needs to be done. But sometimes you figure out what needs to be done, and it it's just a long road ahead, a lot of work to do. So. Um, uh, lately, these quest issues um, have been being made, and they they just list out in thorough detail the kind of things that need to happen to move a certain project forward. Um, I just wanted to chat about it right now because there are a lot of cool ones open. There's a lot of cool work to do that you can pick up that's well described. So if you've ever like thought about getting into some more Ember internal or just wanted to help out or something, now's now's a really cool time. Um, so. Uh, on the Ember.js issue tracker, there is just a label called Quest. So you can keep an eye on that, and every once in a while, a new one pops open. Um, and so these, these are the ones currently. I was just going to go through them real quick. Um, uh, this one, internals, should prefer generic array methods over prototype extensions. It looks mostly complete, but maybe needs someone to go in and like uh, audit some of the documentation and, and make sure it really is wrapped up. So if you're a bit of a conscientious person and like things tidy, this might be a good thing to help with. Um, uh, yeah, uh, this making jQuery optional one is like pretty close. It looks like there's just uh, one chunk of work left. So this was making the test suite just run without jQuery installed. And so if the test suite runs without jQuery, then ideally apps should run without jQuery just fine as well. Um, so they're sort of, uh, if you don't know this, Ember is split into a lot of different sub-packages. Um, and so almost all of those, or all of those sub-packages have been done. And it's just sort of the Ember package that wraps a bunch of this stuff together. Um, and the files are, are sort of listed out and um, uh, just need a little bit of work to, to put that over the edge. So this seems like something that, that you could really help um, finish up if you have a little bit of time. Um, this one, allow plain ES6 classes to be services. Um, uh, this one just needs a little bit of information about your app. Um, they're just trying to audit real world usage of services. So if you have a second to go through your app and find out um, how many services you have in your app and sort of what feature they're using, they could use that information here. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll talk about this one. First, um, this is another sort of testing one. There's just sort of a bunch of, uh, <laughs> uh, by the way, if you didn't see um, uh, Miguel Cambra's talk at EmberConf last year, he made a game. He made an RPG about um, contextual components. Really good. Um <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is just when you run the Ember test suite, a bunch of junk comes out that isn't really relevant. And so this is just about cleaning that up. Um, if you want to churn through some of these, it, it would make the tests like more approachable to people who haven't um, uh, contributed before. Um, so those are sort of a bunch of cleanup ones that have a little bit more to do, um, but they're two like really meaty, interesting ones right now. Um, uh, one is about module unification, and uh, Matt Deal mentioned this at EmberConf. Um, so module unification is something that's been coming for a long time. It's the new module layout. Um, you may have seen a talk about it or something. Um, there are just a lot of practical things that need to happen um, to get it over the line, and they're, they're well described here. Um, there's some stuff in Ember CLI, some stuff in Ember Core, um, the template compiler, and then interestingly, there's the migrator, which I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this has to do with code mods. So if that's an interesting thing to you, um, you could check this out. Um, and, and code mods are 
tr automatic transforms of source code. So automatically migrating someone's app to the new API um, reliably. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff here that would be interesting. And then Glimmer components in Ember. Um, if any of you saw the, uh, what's it called, the, the component manager API RFC, um, this is sort of the, the steps to implementing that. Um, and this is like really thoroughly documented. You'll really <laughs> uh, learn a lot about what's going on under the hood in Ember here. Um, but it doesn't touch every, everything. You know, it, it's limited to the rendering system, and um, there's a lot of like real implementation here. If you want sort of a, a cool chunk of the Ember internal speed code you wrote, uh, you can pick this up. Um, so yeah, th those are the ones that are open right now. I think it's really cool that there's so much well-defined work to do right now. Um, and a lot of these have channels in the Ember Slack where you can ask for help too. Um, and check that everything is still relevant and you know, see if anyone's run into any issues or, or ask for some help if you got started. Um, I am particularly interested in like, diving into these two right now, the Glimmer components and the module unification. So if anyone's interested in getting together for a little hack day sometime soon, uh, talk to me a little later. Um, so yeah, that's it. Those are the cool, interesting questions series right now. Um, yeah, I'm Aaron. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Aaron? Oh, there we go. I'll repeat it. Contributors Workshop at EmberConf this year and has offered to help set them up in any city. Um, so maybe one of us can reach out to her about that. For the stream, contributing to Ember, even Ember core internals is not as scary um, as it might seem at first. Um, and a lot of the quest issue items are very well contained. So you can get in and get out without too many scrapes and bruises. All right, cool. Thanks, Aaron. Um, let's have uh, Zach come up and plug in. Um, now is a great time to uh, put your name on a sheet of paper for the raffle. Excellent. If you haven't already. <laughs> this, this guy, this guy. <laughs> I'm sure that you can do some horse trading after the raffles prizes come out. Or you can always put it on eBay. <laughs> Um, cool. All right. So our next speaker um, is a movable inker. What do you call, Matt Michael, what do you call folks here? Movable inkers or inkers? So we got an inker up next. Um, he's going to talk to us about um, some of the, about the approach that uh, to managing source code that the um, movable ink team takes, um, which is, uh, well, I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'll just let Zach take it. Please help me welcome Zach Maroney. Hey guys, how's it going? So yeah, I work at Movable Inc. I joined the company almost two years ago. And when I came on board, we were right in the middle of a big UX redesign, uh, which was exciting. And out of that, we decided that it would be a great time to make a pattern library. So yeah, I know this talks about monorepos, um, but really it starts with the pattern library. Um, 
and we were really excited about it. We were going to open source it, um, and you know, we started to work on it, and we were, you know, building out the concerns for the app and the UX redesign and the pattern library at the same time, and because the pattern library lived in a separate repository, we had to do like a lot of version bumping, and because we wanted to develop really quickly, sometimes we wanted to skirt that step and we got a little lazy. And uh, because of that, things ended up in the pattern library that shouldn't have been there. Things ended up in the app that should have been in the pattern library. Um, and there were lots of really annoying steps where you know we had to make a pull request that was dependent on one from the pattern library, and then afterwards bump the version, follow up, you know, second pull request. You guys are all nodding your heads, yes. Uh, it was really annoying, and so you know, six months later, a year later, um, we ended up just giving up, sort of, on the pattern library. We had a few apps that were using it, but really only one was being developed on a lot. So we just said, you know what? Let's just leave the pattern library where it is have the few apps that use it continue to use it, and then the one that's using it a lot, we'll just move it into it and as an in-repo add-on. Um, and that was, I mean, a very irresponsible decision, but, uh, but you know, it actually worked out pretty well. Um, however, we knew it wasn't sustainable, and we knew that like this year we were planning on growing a lot, um, moving from like sort of a small company with one Ember team to like a larger one with a whole bunch of teams. Uh, so we needed to like figure out how to solve this problem. Um, and so that was sort of how the discussion about a monorepo was born. Um, we had heard a lot about it. Microsoft had some success with it. Facebook, GitHub, lots of companies. Um, essentially, it's just a whole bunch of different separate applications that are sharing the same GitHub repository. Um, how do you do that? Um, we had a few options that we were looking at. Of these, one big app was actually really appealing because they were all Ember. Um, there wasn't really any compelling architectural reason for them to be in different apps. However, since different teams were working on them, we really wanted to maintain independent deploys. Uh, Ember Engines was also something we looked at, but the documentation was not amazing, and it seemed like the amount of effort to get started was pretty high. Um, we also weren't even sure that it was going to solve the problem. There are a lot of unknowns, and it seemed risky, um, like a lot of investment for possible failure, and we really needed a solution. Um, and then we found Lerna. Uh, Lerna is a library on NPM that, oh, okay, cool, um, that a lot of people are using. Um, when you install it and run Lerna init, it generates a new project with a Lerna.json, and a small package.json, and then a packages folder. And inside of there, you can just add different projects. Um, we found it was pretty easy to migrate uh, existing projects um, and maintain their Git history. Um, you can look it up on Stack Overflow. That's what we did. Um, it had a pretty low cost of getting started. It had a lot of documentations. We used Travis CI, and they had adopted it um, pretty wholeheartedly. Um, so we saw that we could get up and using it pretty quickly. Uh, last year at EmberConf, uh, there was a talk that an employee at Cardstack, who was possibly in this room, gave, um, talked about uh, how they, uh, their experience with monorepos. So we knew you could do it with Ember. And uh, most importantly, uh, it still you know, maintained uh, independence. So different teams could build and deploy. Um, and then also, yeah, minor point. Um, we sort of talked about, you know, well, what if there's a whole bunch of people contributing uh, a bunch of pull requests for different packages in the same repo? Um, we found that you were, it was pretty easy to just automatically label pull requests with, um, you know, the repositories affected. Um, so we decided to give it a shot, and it took about a day to get our first app migrated into our monorepo, and it took a few weeks to get the rest of them. And we really didn't have any headaches at all. Um, well, I'll get into the headaches later. But it was a little bit euphoric how easy the migration was. Um, that was about six months ago. Um, since then, we are using Fluid again. We're updating it all the time. We've added three new apps uh, as we've broken out into more teams. Um, basically, people just add packages into our monorepo um, that I don't even know about and we're like ships passing in the night. It's great. 
um, but we all get to participate in the same pattern library. Um, since the pattern library is uh, an add-on inside of the package, um, we don't need to bump the version. Whenever we push it up, uh, push up changes to it, it runs the tests against all of the apps that consume it. Um, so we know ahead of time if we're going to break anything. Um, we've also been able to leverage just how easy it is to have multiple different packages um, by creating new add-ons that have really narrow concerns. These are things we would never publish on NPM, uh, like our like, very idiosyncratic ESLint plugin that would make no sense to anybody else uh, that we don't want the world to see. Uh, we have like uh, an add-on called Uwatu that's just like all of our, Uwatu is some comic book character. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but it, it handles um, all of our uh, like third-party tracking services, like Mixpanel and stuff like that. So it's a really good, good abstraction for that. We don't have to look at all of that junk. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, we have a bunch of teams using it independently. Um, so it's been really nice. It's, it hasn't been perfect. Um, we still have high build times. Um, one reason why, um, well, actually, there's a trade-off. Um, sometimes the build times are actually great. Uh, with the monorepo, with our configuration, with our CI, if I'm editing a really small package and only making a couple changes, you can have the CI automatically detect that only that package is concerned, so it will only build that package um, until we merge master, and then it will build everything. So the master builds take a while, and the apps that sort of touch everything, like if I make a change to our pattern library, that has to build everything. Um, and right now we're up to about 35 minutes, which is, um, it's pretty bad, but we have a whole bunch of large Ember apps, so, uh, and, and you know, most of the time it's, it's uh, you know, not, not too much of a problem. Um, also something that sort of slipped beneath the cracks uh, or between the cracks that maybe will be addressed at some point is right before we migrated to the mono repo, uh, we added some, some like automated code coverage, just like some test instrumentation with Ember CLI Istanbul. And uh, I never understood how it worked or bothered to because the things it gave me seemed really reasonable and it definitely helped us improve our code coverage. Um, since we've migrated to the mono repo, it doesn't, its output doesn't make any sense anymore half the time. Um, but maybe that will turn around eventually. Um, in the future, I mean, I think we're going to stick with this mono repo, um, this mono repo thing, uh, and I, and I think some of the challenges that we've uh, that I just outlined are going to be addressed. There's something really great um, called Yarn Workspaces that we're looking into. Um, essentially, the way that Lerna works, uh, the packages that are inside of it, the way they consume each other is through sim linking inside of node modules. Um, Yarn Workspaces, like Lerna uses Yarn and Yarn Workspaces just add some extra instrumentation to that to allow common dependencies to be extracted up to a top level node modules directory. So ideally, if all of our Ember apps are using the same Ember version, uh, there's only going to be uh, one, one Ember source directory at the top level of node modules. Um, so hopefully that will cut down on our build times quite a bit. Um, however, not all Ember add-ons are um, compatible with having a top level node modules directory. Um, so there are, there are some, like I know like Ember Polymer, which we don't use, but uh, I, I remember seeing a list somewhere. Um, I think we do use some of them. So there are some hurdles there. Um, I mean, if you're interested in migrating to this, it seems like a great idea. I, I don't think it would be a huge deal to try to, to get those libraries updated. Um, also something else that we're looking forward to with our CI, which is Travis, um, is build stages, um, which just allow us to cut down even further on build times. Um, so that's just an integration. Um, you can use build stages uh, for any number of different kind of test suites, but it seems to be particularly well suited to, um, to mono repos because it allows you to have parallel build processes that run in one stage and then have subsequent stages uh, you know, run only dependent on the success or failure of that build. So essentially, if my if I change fluid and we have to build fluid and the fluid build fails, then we know that the build failed and we can just bail out early instead of you know, um, forgetting about it and coming back 35 minutes later or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's about it. Uh, I would highly recommend, um, you know, if any of these things resonate with you, I would recommend giving it a try. 
Um, if you don't have a lot of apps or you don't have a very large team or you don't have a pattern library, uh, it might be some extra work and you might end up with some really large, um, some really large build files. But, uh, but otherwise, um, yeah, that's about all I got, unless you guys have questions. The question was, are we using fixed or independent versioning for learner packages? Uh, we're not using any versioning. Um, <laughs> yeah, we deploy very often. Yeah, the question is just to get some visualization of what like a learner repository would look like. So at the top level, there's just going to be a package JSON, which is mostly empty, I think. And then a learner.json that just specifies uh, where the package's directory is. Uh, and then inside of the package directory, you have all of your projects. Um, so that's how we migrated them. Um, and then inside of them, they, there's no other like structural change there. Um, so whatever, whatever, the, yeah, whatever your repo looked like, that folder just moves inside of packages. Um, Yeah, pretty much you name it. I mean, we don't have any back end because our back end is Rails, so we don't have any, yeah, our Rails app is in a different, um, yeah. Yeah, we're not, yes, not true mono repo. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose we could be, but. Uh, it's not something we've really talked about. Um, I mean, ultimately, there, there's a lot of conveniences with things being in a mono repo, um, but I think that there are also some decisions to be made uh, around like your team structure and your company structure that would also factor into the choice. Um, we have a lot of, like all of the teams interact with our Rails app um, and running Learn a Bootstrap in our Ember mono repo from uh, blank node modules takes like a decent machine in seven to 10 minutes so I could see the you know members of our engineering team that don't use the Ember apps being really frustrated about having to opt into them um, just to use the Rails app. Um, however, you know if we wanted to have some sort of UX redesign that affected the Rails app, you know that we might start looking into something. Uh, we don't deploy automatically. Um, that, that, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Uh, so when we go versionless, uh, we, we basically run into the possibility of a problem, like I talked about our pattern library a lot. Um, if, if, uh, if someone was making a change to a component or to a part of the app, part of one app that used the pattern library and then someone changed the pattern library, uh, there would be no real way to predict that something might go wrong. Is that sort of the problem that you're outlining? Yeah, we uh, we haven't run into that yet. Um, fortunately, the 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 pattern library and the other add-ons that are sort of consumed by a whole bunch of apps, um, the team structures have sort of partitioned them off so that we don't have like a lot of 
hands in them at the same time. Um, so yeah, we haven't run into that problem. Uh, although, now that you mention it, I'm kind of surprised that we haven't. It might be something that could come up in the future. Um, well, my understanding of Ember engines is not very good. <laughs> um, it, I remember reading about it as, as just sort of an app within an app that you could lazy load. Um, and uh, I, I think the ultimate reason why we decided to use Lerna over engines was because we knew that if migrating to a Lerna monorepo worked, then we could continue to investigate engines and leave that door open in the future. But if we just decided to move straight to engines and it didn't work out, then it would leave us in a tough spot. So it wasn't that we decided against engines for immediately and forever. Um, it was just about moving forward and leaving as many doors open as possible and like making the least risky decision. Yeah, I think they were sort of orthogonal to each other. Thanks, guys. Um, awesome. So also, that was Zach's first meetup talk. So well, well done, sir. Um, OK. Gemma, is it time? She's, I don't know. <laughs> it is. Um, cool. Um, do we have any other volunteers to help draw um, names from the backpack? Any, nope. Okay. No problem. Um, let's move these out to the center. Whoops. Okay. <clears throat> we got the good stuff. Where are the names, Gemma? So here, why don't we do this? Why don't we do, um, you'll, you announce the item and pick a name, and then I'll read the name. Sound it? Okay. Sorry, say that again louder. The backpack does go last. Yeah. I'll hold it up. First, we're going to do pins. Um, an amber, uh, sorry, a uh, Tomster, a Zoe, a Purdy hat, and a 201 creator. Um, all right, pick, pick your name out. The winner is Marcelin. I, n yes, that's it. <laughs> all right. Um, next is Build Tomster. We have Canary. We have Canary, Beta, Beta and Release. All right. And the winner is, whoops. All right. Cam Smith. Smith, Smith. Close. <laughs> All right. Congratulations, Cam. <laughs> okay, next up. Next is a Zoe plush toy. Okay, pick it up. The winner is Jorge Davila. <laughs> Congratulations, Jorge. For anybody who doesn't know, Jorge is my co organizer at MRMYC, organizes the project nights. Of which we forgot to announce the next one. I, I interrupt this raffle to announce that on April 4th, um, we're going to do a project night hosted by Sam and Ryan in the back at, at WeWork, which is where Ember Maps offices are. Um, office. 
I guess you could call it. <laughs> um, and it's going to be on a uh, Ember memory leaks. And there's a basically there's this repository with kind of challenges to try to track down memory leaks in Ember. So it's going to be a kind of joint problem solving, fun time. Um, Ryan and Sam will be on hand to facilitate, and um, I will be. It's on the on the meetup now. You can RSVP. I'll formally announce it after this meetup. We now return to our regularly scheduled programming. Next will be the mason jar with the handle. All right. The winner is Mr. Quest Issues himself, Aaron Sykes. This one is going to be Tom Stewart and Zoe bobble waist figurines. Anybody doesn't know what a bobble waist is? <laughs> the winner is Will Bagby. <laughs> Two more to go. This one is a Tomster collectible mug. The winner is Kareem Baba. Very good thing you got your name in there. Uh, morning coffee or tea right there. Okay, we got one more to go. Ember backpack. And the winner is Hassan. <laughs> Card stack cleaning up tonight. Yeah. All right, let's take the names Three out. Five. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. So uh, these prizes were donated by um, Tilde uh, to the Ember NYC meetup. Um, so round of applause for um, Leia and Tilde. Thank you. Um, and let's uh, give it up for our raffle administrator. Thank you, Gemma. OK. We are now ready for the main event. Um, in town, despite his Amtrak train being canceled, uh, direct from Boston and the week before Portland, Oregon, uh, where he gave one of the, um, the most well-received talks at EmberConf. Um, I'm very excited to introduce to you uh, the one and only Ed Faulkner. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Luke, for that intro. I, uh, I'm definitely feeling all of that. <laughs> so this may be a little more freeform, artistic, off the cuff uh, than some of my talks. Um, there's definitely a bunch of big ideas I want to try to convey. Uh, and uh, so some of, you, some of you may have, some of you were at EmberConf, some of you saw my talk about Ember Animated, uh, super exciting project I'm really happy to be sharing with the community. We've since that talk, I got a whole bunch of new contributors, which is awesome. We're seeing the force multiplier of the community, people stepping up, uh, mostly to help document and teach and get it to a shape where other people can really use it, uh, which has been great. Um, this talk's going to be less like practical, here's what my software does kind of talk, or here's something you can use directly in your apps. I wanted to do something a little more just like, a little more blue sky, a little more just for fun, looking at some basics uh, to try to motivate discussion. Your, notate your thoughts on some big, big ideas about uh, how people learn, why you should care about that, how it affects the way you design software. So I want to just start by building up a little, kind of a little toy world uh, using animations. We're still talking animations here. Um, but I'm going to do it like very low level, just looking at raw stuff, not really using any fancy libraries or anything. So we could focus on just like seeing that stuff's not magic. Right, seeing that this is stuff you can understand and you shouldn't be afraid of. So I'm going to start with uh, an, a very simple little setup where literally I'm just going to click and it makes a circle, and that's really boring. Um, and that's kind of the point of the setup is to show you like this is stuff you can understand. It's nothing exciting. Uh, I'm making a component called the world, and it's just going to hold my whole little universe of dots. It's dot world. And uh, for everyone, and it's, it's an SVG context. So if you're not familiar with scalable vector graphics, that's SVG. And it's really just a nice way in web apps to, to draw things that are really much more about drawing.
drawing shapes than about laying out text or documents, things like that. So it has a nice thing you can say, like circle, and you can say where its center is and how, how big its radius is, right? So that's all that, uh, this is all we needed to do. Here's the world. The world is just like an SVG that yields out my dots and it has a create dot action. And um, here's like a create dot action, right? When you click, we figure out where in the world was that event, and we make a dot. And we put it on our list of dots. Okay. And um, where in the world here is just kind of a detail. It's not even super important. It's basically the idea that the coordinates inside your SVG may not match exactly the coordinates of your screen, right? It could be, sh it could be scaled down, it could be scaled up. Um, so this is just like, this is literally a copy paste from Stack Overflow, right? Just, this is a good, perfect example of what's a good thing to do there. Um, so, so let's, uh, let's make our world a little more interactive. So instead of just making them all the same size, let's make it so that we can like decide how big our dots are, right? Now we can at least like draw a snowman. At least that's a little less boring. Um, or maybe a happy face or something. Uh, oh, that, that's more like a whoa face. Uh, so, okay, how, 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 more how much more complicated does that get? It seems a lot more complicated now. We've got dragging going on and all kinds of stuff. Um, here's, a, here's a shout out for Ember Concurrency. Um, if you're not familiar with Ember Concurrency, because you're new here, uh, blame Alex Matchinger back there. Uh, it's a great library for managing things that all have that, managing basically state and concurrency in, in your application. And here's, this is an example of laying out an Ember Concurrency task to do this kind of dragging. So I'm again needing to figure out where in the world I'm clicking based on, so this is, this task is gonna run just because I'm, it's got, it's my quick handler, right? It gets the actual DOM event. I'm gonna figure out where it happened. I'm gonna make a new dot. And now I'm actually just setting that as a thing that I'm gonna, have, like a new dot is actually drawn. And then I'm lo actually looping here. While true, I'm going to uh, wait for either of these two events to happen. Alex is probably there wondering, how the heck did you make that work? Because that doesn't work in my library. Uh, this is my own wait for event. We've got to talk about why, why, that, why yours doesn't yield a promise that can be erased. Uh, <laughs> I, I can make fun of Alex because he, he loves me. It's OK, we're friends. Um, and. Uh, so we're gonna find where that event happened. Uh, we're gonna see how far it is from where we started and we're gonna figure out that distance and we're gonna make that be the new radius of our new point. So that's why our radius changes as we drag, right? We're just making new events that are some distance from the initial event, right? And that's all it is. You can do that, it's simple. And if our event happens to be a mouse up instead of a drag, then we're done and we break out of our loop. And that's when we move our new dot into the list of alive dots and we no longer have a new dot. So pretty, pretty straightforward. And uh, here's our, uh, yeah, so anyway, next change. This is way too monochrome. We need some color in our little dot world. So I'm going to extend my circles so that they now have a, uh, a fill color, and the dots all have a hue. And I'm just going to pick a hue that is like actually just derived from my radius. So the map here, uh, hue, if you're, if you're not familiar, is just a way to express what color we're talking about. It's a little different than RGB. It's really focused, it really separates out you get one number that really represents which color is it, and then uh, two other numbers for basically how bright is it and how saturated is it. So it's really nice for picking colors. Um, and this, uh, I literally just made this up because it looked good. I mean, it has to be, the mod 360 here at the end, make sure that it fits in the right range. The plus 180 is just literally, it looks good, so. Uh, so now they could do things like this. When they get bigger, they change color, and they're much more pretty now. All right, our world is cooler now. It's getting cooler. All right, but our world is still very static. Once we make a thing, that's really it. So let's look at uh, giving our world motion now. Um, so I'm introducing another Ember concurrency task and I'm just calling it run. And this is gonna run basically all the time while our world is alive. And you know, if you can see the run is not real long, it doesn't do a whole lot of stuff. Um, it's, again, I get to do a while true and then basically, <coughs> excuse me, uh, ask what's my current time? How much has my time changed from the last time? And then here we're going to call this like we're going to call a hook that we'll just call apply physics. This universe we're creating needs some physics, and uh, it's going to just get all of our live dots and how much time step moved, and it's going to give us new dots. Right. And that's it. And then yield wrap here. This is a little helper method that you can see in my code when I post it. Um, this is just short shorthand for request animation frame, which is a built-in browser thing, and it's really what you want if you're trying to do something once per screen re screen render. Uh, it's it's that's why it's called request animation frame. It's perfect for animation. Um, 
this yield request animation frame is really just, it's giving me back a promise that will resolve when it's time to paint again. So that I'm gonna draw the screen just as fast as the screen wants to be drawn. Now I'm not wasting cycles drawing too fast and I'm not making it look bad by drawing too slow. Uh, and so this is gonna run at different speeds on different hardware uh, under different conditions, whatever the browser thinks is the best speed. Um, so now my world takes an apply physics method that's gonna be my physics. And uh, I'm gonna give my world these physics, which are pretty simple. I think we, I, c I can hope that we can look at this little chunk of math and not be too intimidated, even if we hate math, because like this is uh, nothing but multiplications and adding, right? Every dot, I'm giving every dot, it still has an X and a Y position, and, but I'm also giving it a, a velocity X and velocity Y, so it's gonna be moving. And uh, every dot's X is just gonna change by its velocity every time step, right? This is just your speed times your time added to your position. And we do that twice, because we have an X and a Y. And our velocity also changes in the same way by our acceleration, right? So acceleration is just how fast your velocity changes. So, and I'm just, in this world, there's no acceleration. Everything's just acceleration zero. So it's nice and simple. So now, oh, and I added another thing that, um, because we need to set these initial velocities, uh, I didn't show the code for this. Uh, I didn't want to bog down the talk with that. But now, after I make a circle, I can basically slingshot it, and then it'll go that way, right? So, like, that's kind of fun. Our world is getting cooler. Uh, it kind of feels more like a party now, like balloons, maybe. Uh, so the point, though, here is that, like, that's not a lot of math, right, to get something that starts to feel pretty real. Uh, so let's, let's go a little farther. Um, let's change our accelerations here so that now we have an acceleration in the y direction. That's just, again, this is a magical number that just feels good when you run this. Trial and error, that's how you make, make things, make, try it out, right? So uh, any guesses what I'm doing here? Gravity, yeah, exactly. So now, uh, now when I launch my things, well, I threw it too hard though, can't see. No, nope, I'm on the wrong version, here it is. There we go, right. So now we've discovered the parabola, right? Like we've discovered ballistic trajectories. And that's, that's not a small thing, right? Like if your math teacher wanted to sit you down and ask you to derive what shape is a ballistic trajectory, like you might just t totally tune out, right? Um, but here, just by building up a system and playing with it interactively, uh, we could develop an intuition and we could discover these things for ourselves. Such a powerful method of learning uh, that is vastly more effective than just sitting somebody down and trying to, keep trying to say in words a thing that is just not a words thing. Right? It's something we have other aspects of our brains and intelligences to interpret. Um, this is gonna be the, the, like, the last and most advanced version of my physics. So I created gravity. It's great that gravity goes down, that's a, but that's a very like earth, surf, earth surface centric kind of point of view. Uh, gravity doesn't just go down, right? It goes from, op from one object to another. Right? So that's what, we are, that's what I've implemented here. Uh, this is definitely more math, but it's not too bad. Let's take a look at it together. Um, right? I'm, for, everyone, for every single dot, I'm going to start adding up how much acceleration it has. It's going to start with none. And I'm going to look at every other dot. And except we don't compare it to itself, because that wouldn't make sense. And we're going to look at basically just how, f this is the dx dy here, this is my position minus the other one's position. This is a, this is a vector, two-dimensional vector. Don't be scared of the word vector, though, even if you don't like math. We're getting there, we're almost done. Uh, this is stuff that you definitely saw in high school, and maybe you've tuned out, right? Like, that's the distance between two points. I'm keeping both the distance squared and the distance, because I need them both, so I'm just going to keep them around. And uh, I'm adding uh, the very simplest collision detection here. If they're, because if they're closer than the sum of their radii, then they touch, right? And uh, so I just made a rule here that says if you, when they touch, the smaller one disappears. Very simple. Um, and I could have totally ignored collision, and I kind of wanted to, but it turns out it does really bad things to your universe if you don't uh, have any collision at all. Uh, because things can get arbitrarily close together means they can exert arbitrarily strong forces on each other and like launch each other at the speed of light or something crazy. Um, so, you know, when you're designing universes, definitely do it with care, you know, watch out for singularities and, uh, you know, um, as an exercise for the reader, you should think about uh, in the real world, what actually happens to gravity when you go inside of a body? 
it's like kind of like you you know as if we think about gravity is just like the, sh the closer you get the stronger it is is it infinitely strong when you get to the center of the earth it's not um, there's actually some kind of interesting math proposals done to show that it's kind of cool um, it's harmonic motion yes uh, so and here is just like your classic uh, Newtonian gravitation and um, I have a little mass of helper because I had to kind of like um, impute mass now to my objects um, I basically did it by assuming, well, if like these radii were actually spheres, it'd basically be like the radii to the three seems good. Um, and I had to just make it small enough that they wouldn't fly so fast you can't see them, basically. Um, and so once you have a force, you, ha you can figure out, you basically just make it proportional to the, so the it's basically proportional in the right directions, right? How much am I pulling in the X? How much am I pulling in the Y? That's all that's going on here. And then that's it. This is the rest of this is what we already saw. This is us just updating our position based on our velocity and our velocity based on our acceleration. So now our accelerations are, are computed. So that was the end of the hard stuff. All right, so now um, this is where I get to try to make it all work in real time. Let's say, and I, I don't like the yellow color. It's too hard to see on the screen. Let me, oops. Let me make a nice red world. Uh, so make a nice little thing. Now, of course, gravity still works the way you'd expect, right? You throw objects on the surface of the Earth, they just kind of do their thing. But if you throw them harder, they go around further, right? They start to go over the horizon. Uh, whoop, too hard. Let's try to get the right. No, it's still a little. Oh, that one's gonna, probably going to come back, but it's going to take a long time. And you know, the, so the whole point of this exercise is that we can now play, right? Like you can actually start to feel what's involved in the in the mechanics here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, with with a very small amount of math, right? Like stuff that is definitely things you you would have encountered in high school if you were if you were tuned in, and I don't totally don't blame you, <laughs> totally don't blame you if you weren't. Um, a lot of really deep facts come out, right? Like this system has rich behavior. Um, we start to see things like um, if you can, if I if I had time to add trails to these guys, so you can see the shapes of their orbits. You'd see that we have ellipses, right? These are elliptical orbits. You'd see that the uh, the body we're orbiting around, uh, which is actually slowly drifting away because it's it's not quite massive enough to not to really ignore the mass of the little blue guys. Um, you'd see that it's. Uh, it's at one of the foci of the ellipse. It's not in the middle, right? Uh, you, would s you can actually see that the closer the object, the rotating object, it, it, the orbiting object is to the main body, the faster it's moving. It's going really slow when it's far away. It's going fast when it's closer. All these things, like, you can obviously sit. The, the people who first figured this out just by, like, sitting there with their giant table of observations from their telescopes and their, and their m calculations by hand were absolutely genius level. Uh, but the pitch is that we have a way to assist our thinking and our learning now. We have these computational tools that let us offload some of that processing into the, into the world, into our computers, uh, to do things that they couldn't do. And we, this is just a different way to learn, right? Um, so why does it work, right? Why do we learn better this way? Um, a lot of it has to do with uh, getting to be in a world, right? Getting to uh, to poke at it and see what happens, right? Um, these are still somewhat effective when you're just looking at them, but being able to actually change things uh, is how you really get, get learn the dynamics of a system. And it's actually how all children learn how the world works all the time. Um, so back in, like, going back quite a long ways, like starting in the 60s, a guy named Seymour Papert out of the MIT Media Lab wrote, started writing about these ideas of uh, how people learn uh, he wrote a great book called Mindstorms. You should totally check out. The basic thesis, and the, yeah, the Legos Mindstorms are totally inspired by that. He also is the creative logo, the language logo, uh, the turtles and the graphics. And his basic thesis was children and, children and everyone very clearly are great at absorbing the things that are in the world around them, right? The things they can actually experience, they learn in a very deep way. And, um, you know, some of the things you learn are actually, if you try to sit down and lay them all out in precise mathematical logic, they're really complicated. Like, the fact that you have intuition about how things move through space or how, you know, heat behaves or all these things that you just learn intuitively, 
they're actually really complicated concepts, but you learn them flaw—you learn th all, almost all children learn them flawlessly because they're in the environment. And so Seymour Papert's thesis was, we can start creating new environments now, right? And when it's on the screen, that's actually some power. That's there's some power there, right? It's uh, it's a visual visual approximation of the real world. And he also tried to bring it out more physically too. Like the lo logo wasn't just turtles on screens; he built turtles like robots. Um, and a lot of that work has continued forward, and the ideas are great and they work, um, which always makes people ask, well, like, why over like 60 years has this stuff not really taken off? I think it's because the ideas are very subversive to the way schools work today. Like, you have to really allow a lot of super open-ended exploration where there's no right answers, and uh, the children get to question everything, and like that's pretty anti-authoritarian, and schools have a hard time with that. So. Um, but that's also why I like his stuff. And you know, why is all this relevant to, to us as working programmers? Um, it's because everything we make uh, is deeply and tied to learning. Because whether you're making, whether you're trying to design a screen that's for some end user, right, who needs to learn how to use it, that's clearly something you've got to help them guide them through the learning. But even when if you're just writing a piece of code for another programmer to use, they're going to have to learn how it works, right? Uh, and even if you're just working in total isolation, which is of course very rare for a real practical programmer these days, but even in those cases, you you're, you yourself are going to have to come back and learn this stuff again because you just can't keep it all. It's not going to be there if you come back in a year. It's not going to be still in your head. You have to uh, you have to be able to come back and learn again what you left for yourself. So, in all these cases. Being able to model how the next person is going to learn what you're presenting to them is like the key meta skill of being able to design software and design APIs. Um, I wanted so I wanted to add um, as a wrap up to me ma bombarding you with math. I actually joke. Am I ever kind of tough? I actually joked that I was going to bombard them with math because it was like the last talk of the day, and I was like, "This is about animation. We're just going to look at math for 30 minutes." Uh, and I didn't make them do that, so I had to get you guys here instead. Um, so there's these kind of two arguing perspectives sometimes you hear about programming, right? Like, don't worry, if you didn't like math in school, you can still be a great programmer. You rarely need that stuff in your practical day job. Versus programming is very deeply connected to math and it'll make you a better programmer. Um, and so like, which of these perspectives is right? There's a kind of cop-out answer that says, well, it depends what kind of programming you do. And actually, I'm not I'm gonna set that aside. I mean, it does. But even for a single programmer in a single environment, in a single point in time, I actually think these are both true. And it's because there's a loophole. It's the in-school part, uh, right? Because most of what we learn in school is math. Is really kind of the dead, dried-up husk of math. Um, and uh, most of if you, and of course, people could have then say, well, isn't like doesn't the word kind of defined by what everybody uses it as? And then aren't they therefore right? And you don't really know what math is. Well, I kind of would say, well, I kind of trust the mathematicians. What they do is math. And if you look at what they do, it's actually very much closer to what we all do every day when we design software, right? When we're thinking through, uh, particularly when we're trying to design something like an API that other people are going to use, like Ember Animated, we really need to know how a system composes, right? Um, part of the reason I wanted to do this little exercise with our orbits was to show how a very small kernel still can bring extremely rich dynamics when it's the right kernel of functionality, right? And uh, that's obviously true of the best software APIs we use as well. So something like, something as basic as the fact that HTML elements can be combined in all kinds of ways, right? Something as simple as the fact that, uh, you know, pretty much any function can call any other function, right? We take these things for granted, but they are examples of uh, systems that are designed with a, with a sense of closure where Basically, anything can plug into anything, and you still get a sensible result. And uh, you can, of course, take that very, very far, especially when you start to look at things like type systems and all that stuff. Um, it's all, it's the thinking you're doing all the time anyway. Uh, and so I just like to encourage programmers who think they hate math uh, to, to, to think again and realize that you might hate math for very good reasons because you were, you had all the f actual fun math beaten out of you as a child. Uh, but there is, but math is actually very creative, very uh, aesthetic. Uh, it's, if you like the idea of looking at a really elegantly designed API and saying, that's really great, 
Um, how did they do that? I want to do that too. Uh, that's the same feeling you get if you're interested in math. Like it's the same. It's the same thing. It's the search for elegant patterns. It's math is an art. Uh, it's an art as much as music is an art. People think of it as this much more dead and dried thing, but it's not. So that was my my ode to why you should care about math. Uh, now, um, so all of that is like. That's the that's the, the end of these slides. I, I wanted to um, just look at a couple examples of out of my slides from Amber Animated um, examples of what I mean by APIs that are designed with kind of a composition in mind. Um, right. So um, let's see which example am I looking at? Oh yeah, okay. So this is a demo I, I showed at EmberConf. And it's the idea that we have this list of our, of our Tomsters and Zoe's, and we can add some, and we can add them as fast as we want, and the system itself is going to figure out for me how they, should, how they need to interact with each other. Right? Um, it's a nice effect. Right? It's, uh, the code to do it ends up being very straightforward. All right? And so the question is, you know, how does it actually, how does this go all the way to this? Right? Um, like it seems like there's a lot of missing steps. Um, and obviously, in a sense, there are. Right? There always are in programming. Your uh, the whole thing only works if you're willing to accept that abstractions are a thing, right? You don't want to have to know what every electron's doing down there. Uh, so the when we talk about abstractions, people often try to frame it in terms of how much abstraction is good versus bad, or too much, too much or too little. Um, I always caution people not to try to frame it that way, because there's, if there's such a thing as too much, we're already way, way past the budget. Uh, it's, it's really a question of the quality of the abstractions, right? And so it's a question of how well do they compose, how many nice things can you say with them, and uh, how, uh, how much do they leak, right? In the sense, a leaky abstraction, of course, is one where usually you can just take it and it does what it says on the tin and you can trust it. But sometimes it doesn't, and you need to care about that. And you need to sometimes look inside and see how it works and why it breaks. And now it's not an abstraction anymore. Now whatever's inside there matters to you. Right? So, um, so keeping in the spirit of designing for learnability, uh, one of the theme, one of the, the themes here is uh, APIs need to look nice at not at, at all the layers. Uh, it is a fact that abstractions leak. No, almost none of them are perfect. Uh, the best ones leak less, but they still leak a little. And so there's always going to come a point where it's time to dive down a layer. The uh, the willingness and ability to dive down a layer is really the mark of when somebody has grown as an experienced programmer. If you're starting out and you are a newbie or you consider yourself a newbie or maybe you underrate yourself, but uh, that is the skill to think about. When you get a chance, when you find something that breaks at the next layer down, when Ember itself is messing with you, right, or the browser is or jQuery is or anything, right, that's actually a really great opportunity to learn because uh, you don't learn the next layer down by just like trying to read it like a novel, right? Uh, you don't learn how Ember works by like working from the beginning of the repo to the end and just reading. Uh, nobody does that. Uh, I mean, maybe somebody does that. I've never met that person. Uh, you learn it because you're trying to focus on a specific problem. You're following threads of functionality, right? Um, so when you find a bug in something down below you, that's a huge opportunity because you have a motivated reason to go in there and try to find, find out what's really going on. Um, so, but the point of saying that is that layers matter. And so when you have to look inside, what do you find? Right? Um, so the point of, uh, of me, and the point of me putting this code on this slide is that I made this new library as opposed to the older liquid fire library that, I, that I'm going to eventually be integrating this into. Uh, because in, if you look at liquid fire, we had a pretty nice API at kind of the this layer. But if you wanted to go down one more layer, it was just like you're totally on your own, right? 
And so it was very easy to say, like, I want this thing to move to the left. Um, but if you had to go down inside and implement how those motions worked, it was just the Wild West, right? Um, so uh, this, is, this library is an example of trying to have a nice layer at the next level down. So now instead of just having transitions, we have transitions and motions. And the kind of stuff I showed you earlier with the, my little orbital example, that's basically what you, the kind of stuff you need to know to do motions. Um, it's, not, it's not stuff you, you can't do. So that is, uh, I want to leave you with one last thought about, um, about learning and, so, and code, which is to try to be aware of the distinction between trying to learn something from the raw axioms, starting with the very smallest pieces and building up, versus the way of learning of the way you actually learned English. Uh, nobody learns to speak English by learning the diagram sentences, right? We learn it by mimicry. We learn it by starting with a very fuzzy estimate of how the thing works. But, we, but you begin using it even when you have a fuzzy understanding. And that gives, generates the feedback that you need to actually learn mastery of a language. Right? Computer languages and systems are no different than that. Uh, the reality is that people learn them in a fuzzy kind of holistic way. Um, you don't have to feel like you need to know how everything works. You just get the gist of it. Um, and uh, systems designers often fall into the trap because when you're writing the system, you had to start from the bottom up, right? So it's very tempting to try to teach your software that way, to say, this is the very bottom primitive, and then we put those together to make this, and then we put those together to make this. Um, it's a trap, right? The way you have to build it is kind of the opposite of the way people are really going to learn it. And so think about uh, when you're designing a system or when you're trying to teach somebody else about it, think about how friendly is it for somebody to approach at a superficial level first, and does it invite them to go to the next level down, as opposed to being deeply hostile and saying, look, you've got to start at the very bottom, and you've got to start with you know, F equals MA, and move yourself up to ellipses and orbital mechanics, right? It's we, uh, that's how you build it, but that's not how you learn it. Uh, just as you don't, that's not how you learn language. So that I will leave you with that thought. And um, that's the end of my program. I'm happy to take questions about anything. No, uh, like this stuff for sure, but uh, also anything you've heard from EmberCore or at EmberConf or other stuff we've been working on. Yeah. Oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. That's good. I almost wore a shirt that's exactly that color. I really wish I did now. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I'm just very, very in tune with the environment, I think. Yeah. Sam. Have I heard of Brett Victor? I've met Brett Victor, yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, he does some, Brett Victor is a guy who does some really interesting work on design. Um, and I like a lot of his statements of the problem of making how we can make his computer systems more humane. Um, he has a pretty interesting experiment going on right now. I think it's in California. And he has an actual physical lab where like, members of the community can come in, anybody, and try a new form of physical computing. And mostly what that means right now is uh, it's very paper-based. There's basically cameras in the ceiling all over the whole room. And you've got sheets of paper, and they might have like colored stickers at the corners so the computer can track them better. Um, and people build computation as groups together, sharing information, moving things around by literally like writing things on papers and placing them th in places and writing code that glues them together so that like you can physically add something to your to-do list by like you know putting it on the file there and moving or moving to the next state. Um, so he's got a lot of good, a lot of pretty good ideas. Um, I do think that some people, uh, some people look at the, look at some of his good ideas, that are particularly ones about making programming more visual, uh, making it the state of programs something you can see better. Um, I think there's great value in that, but I also think there are some structural fundamental limits to how far you can take it. And some people, some people have interpreted his stuff and tried to push it and say like, all our programming should be visual. 
there's like a 30 year history of trying that and not succeeding. And I think there's some actual real structural reasons why. Like symbolic thinking is a real thing we also need. Right? So when I talk about the difference in learning orbital mechanics by manipulating symbols on a piece of paper versus seeing it and feeling it in a world you can actually push, um, that's really engaging two very different ways of thinking. They're, they're complementary to each other. We absolutely need to use both for different tasks and sometimes both together. Um, but some, but there are tasks that are just so much better suited to one from one system to another that it's just that one leaves the other in the shade, right? You wouldn't try to catch a softball by like doing the the symbolic computations; you would lose. Um, but you also really can't uh, like compose a epic poem uh, focusing solely on your spatial side and not your symbolic side, right? Like our language, our whole language instinct is deeply symbolic. And I really do believe that computer languages function as languages. It's not just an analogy. They're a tool for thinking, right? So I think they're deeply symbolic, and you can only go so far making them spatial, visual. Um, where the opportunities align, it's great. Um, it's just, you know, there's lots of nice little examples that demo really well on toy examples. And then the hard part is the, co is the composition. It's the composition in the large. Like when you, have, when you go beyond one small, when you go beyond just tweaking a variable and watching it change one thing uh, and you have vast composition, it gets harder. So I like Brad Victor's work. I think some people take the visual thing too far. Uh, do I think programming might not be typing code someday? Um, that's a hard one. Uh, it, I think it will still be symbolic uh, no matter what. Um, it won't be entirely spatial visual. How it's symbolic, I don't know. Right? You could have, certainly have a conversation with a computer someday to do programming. I do think that our programming is already much closer to conversation than, than what people were doing a, you know, a generation ago. Uh, it, it's really kind of insightful to look at what, if you, like, it's, always, it's interesting to read old papers in computer science for the ideas, of course. Like, there's good ideas, and a lot of them are fairly timeless. But a lot of the stuff that I find really amusing is the ancillary details of, like, yeah, we did this thing, and oh, boy, it was really hard. Uh, just as an example, there was a, I saw a paper recently about, it's probably from the 70s, about different, different ways to break down a large program into modules, right? Obviously, like, that's one of the hard fundamental problems. Like, what's the good module boundaries? Um, and people had basically thought about it pretty solidly all the way back then. Um, but their, their, their downside when they said, oh, you can actually break this into a bunch of little elegant modules. But of course, like the function call overhead of having to have like different modules is so expensive that we had to do these crazy tricks to make it work. Right? And of course, today we wouldn't care. It doesn't matter at all. Like, there's the cost, the overhead of a function is nothing. Right? So um, like those little details are always fun. And I brought that up because uh, our programming is much more conversational now. And, uh, like if you're not getting real-time feedback, at least from your editor while you're writing, say, Ember code, you totally want to turn that on and get some help to get to see it. Um, it's just a different, totally different mindset when you're having a conversation. Um, this is something that I think, uh, like Elm language gets really good r rave uh, love for the really great feedback that the Elm compiler gives you. I think the Rust compiler is another great example of, of that. Like good examples of having a conversation with the computer. N trying to offload some of the thinking, the parts of the thinking that it's good at to it is really powerful. Yeah. Ali. Oh, I haven't heard about that. That sounds interesting. So there's an intermediate representation of human languages? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Confirm. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> 
totally. <laughs> totally. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Correct. And that that's actually a good uh, example of what I mean when I say, like, you can't really learn a code base by, go by reading it start to end, right? Uh, learning those, it's definitely a different, it's, it's, it's totally a weird and alien way to use language is what we do. That's actually why it's so weird and threatening and why it's, like, something not everybody can do, right? And it takes a lot of intense training you're good at. Um, it is totally still a use of language, but it's a very alien way to do it, particularly because it's not linear, right? And it's about f expressing concepts at multiple levels of refinement simultaneously and being able to go up and down that stack, and all that is deeply weird, and I totally agree. Um, it, and though to your point about intermediate languages for human languages, um, like, that's a thing that compilers have had a long time, right? Like, our computer languages do, in fact, typically get go down to a couple different standard intermediate languages, actually, before they run. Uh, so, like, you're writing JavaScript and somebody else is writing C++, but there's actually a microcode language that they're going to get to compile to before the processor does anything with them. Uh, so, like, these same ideas pop out. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yes? Sure. So, recommendations on, like, the psychology of learning. Um, I would say I'm a big... Uh, I, I think I'm a big supporter of the whole literature around uh, Maria Montessori, the Montessori method, for example. It's, it's a good example of, of a community that, a community, like in the same sense that we're an Ember community, of kind of shared lessons carried forward, trying to collaborate together, doing things in a very uh, observation driven way to try to find what works and come up with ideas. And, um, and they've been doing it a long, long time now, right? Like, I think 100 years or something. So, uh, and like the, the proof is in the pudding, it, like there's whole generations of children and then there are children who've gone through these systems and had, and had very positive experiences come away um, as whole people that are, you know, there's a value judgment in what is a well-educated person, like what does that mean, what is a good life, all of that. Um, but I think that that's an example of a community that has really good ideas. I would look at that. And there's a lot of tangential ones, like other people obviously cross pollinate there too. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an endless debate over what's the right level. Uh, I think I do like to try to shift that debate from what's the right amount of abstraction to like how, what's a quality abstraction, right? Like when somebody says this is too much abstraction, it's too much magic, this feels bad, it's causing problems, they're reacting to a real problem. Like they're not wrong, right? But they tend to, s if, but if they say it in the words, this is just too much abstraction, I think they're misdiagnosing the problem. They're mischaracterizing the problem. The problem is actually that some of their abstractions are just the wrong ones. Like, there's totally true that plenty of abstractions are not great. Um, and finding good ones is, uh, it's a hard thing. And in particular, it's actually the whole reason I like, uh, it, it's kind of the whole reason a framework community should exist. Because it's too hard as one individual, right? The whole point of an abstraction is that it covers a vast number of cases, right? If it only covers your case, it's not an abstraction. It's just your, your code, right? It's your one solution. So to be a good, a really good abstraction, you have to have a vast, you have to have a really broad problem space to bang it against and see if it's good and learn from, right? Uh, it's generally more than you could do as just one individual sitting in a room. Um, so, you know, like uh, Ember Animated came out of 
me going to help people make animations that they said, hey, geez, like, I want to do this. It seems like it should be possible. It's not possible. I could think of like at least five different examples that stand out in my mind where we ran up against the hard thing. Uh, and I just had to say, like, yeah, like the libraries we have don't do this yet. It's hard. And I can see that it's bad. Um, that experience as a community is what let us discover better APIs that I think now cover all those cases that I know about. And I'm sure now that these new APIs are out in the world, people will still find the things they don't do, too. Um, but that's like why we do things as a community. That's why we try to con get consensus on uh, standards and abstractions. Uh, because there's like, there are the abstractions that we all take completely for granted and don't even think about, which are in many cases like way more intimidating and deep than anything people debate. Like people debate the last 3% of their abstractions, like whether they should use a JavaScript framework or write vanilla JavaScript. Like that's on the stack of abstractions, that's like the last couple percent, right? Like below that you have the vast code base of a whole browser and all of its dependencies. And below that you have the vast code base of a whole operating system and its dependencies. And below that you have the processing, go the processor itself, which has a microcode engine, right? And like it's really scary stuff, right? Like uh, so like my point is that there's some floor that people stop thinking about and don't worry about, right? And it's not just in programming, it's a lot of things. Like you generally, like we are, fortunate enough that we don't have to really think about like, is that a good place to work because like, will they have reliable electricity there, right? Like people do worry about that in a lot of the world, right? We don't have to worry about that here, we're fortunate. But like, that's just like infrastructure. It's just like taken for granted, it's a utility, right? Um, much of what we use in computing is that and people don't worry about it. And then you have the stuff that's debated, which is really like the leading edge, it's the future because the things that we take for granted today were absolutely debated endlessly in the past, right? Like people thought that it was using a C compiler was like so wasteful because real programmers who care about performance are gonna write their assembly by hand. That was totally a mainstream position that people argued about for years, right? And like every layer of the stack has done that. Um, so what we're doing here as a community is really trying on for size future abstractions that will eventually be the infrastructure, right? Like, I would fully expect that, you know, far enough down the line, the kind of things that Ember has as a framework are just things that, like, everybody will take for granted. They'll just be there, out there, right? Like, maybe it's some future amazing web components that all browsers just support that do everything you want, right? Something like that will totally exist because it just will. It's just like there's an obvious economic imperative to just stop solving the same problems over and over again. But it takes a lot of work to get there and it can't be done by one small group of people and it usually can't even be done by one company because you just don't get a broad enough set of the problem. So that's what we do as framework communities. We are trying to uh, basically opt into a consensus reality where we're all in the future trying on this future set of infrastructure and seeing if it works. And you need, a, you need to get a critical mass of people in there because it's not just does it work for me, it's like does it work for an ecosystem? Can I, can I ship code at, that other people can use and actually works if we share these abstractions? So um, it's kind of like, what are we all doing here? Right. Yeah. Uh, Gaurav. Mm, right. Yeah, yeah, should everybody learn to code? Well, uh, certainly everyone should have the opportunity to learn to code that I had to learn to code. And that's a, that would be a major, major radical change from the way, way things are, right, obviously. Uh, will they choose to? I don't know. Um, but we can't really know that for them, right? So it's, I think I, think I would, g I would put my weight down on the uh, equality of opportunity side and say we don't know, but we really can't know that because people don't get a try today. Uh, I do think that... Coding is really just, you know, again, I'll, I'll tie it to math because there are, like, once you get to, once you've seen all of the really annoying, like, accidental details of programming enough, and you've just done it for years, and, like, the little, s that stuff is just baked in, and you don't worry about it so much, there's the hard, there's always still hard stuff that's left, and that really all falls into the buckets of design or math, I think. Um, and so, like, those skills, of course, are, are themselves way broader than coding. 
Uh, I think like in some future happy world where our computers are so well designed that there's no accidental complexity and they just do what you mean, uh, that would still not solve the problems of design and, uh, and math, right? Like, so depending on which problem you're trying to attack, you'll need one or both of those things. Uh, those skills are just, are like, so they're the hard skills that never go away in coding. So when you say, should people learn to code, I think they should learn those skills, yes. And those skills are like bigger than coding, right? It's how do you solve problems? How do you, how do you solve problems as, as collectively as a group? Uh, how do you communicate their solutions, right? So, you know, I guess it, if you mean coding literally, probably not, but I think the actual hard part of coding is things that everybody does need to learn. Yeah. Luke. Sure, that's a great idea. Yeah, we don't need an example. We could do a real one. Um, let's see. Let me go find. Uh, let's see. Let me try to make this bigger. Ooh, okay, that's probably is this the whole browser? No, that's just that buffer. Okay, well we'll find the code first. So uh, in Ember animated, um, I will first show the high level thing again, which is. Yeah, let's do, well, I had one on the screen, right? A transition. We'll do the slides again, because there'll be one here. So, yeah. So this is, this is an example of a transition, right? This is the kind of higher level, that, and we're gonna go below it. Uh, at the high level, what's important here is that uh, we're mapping categories of, and I didn't define sprites here, uh, but, you could think a sprite is really just a name for like a little movable piece of your stuff that you want to move around. And it, the name comes out of the history of computer graphics and people have used that word for, you know, I, you know, the word literally means like an elf. Like it's from, it's from mythology, right? Uh, so maybe it translates really weird to somebody if you're not a native English speaker. But, um, and it was because people were making graphics and games and the thing you were moving might have been an elf. I don't know, maybe that's why they started calling them sprites. Um, but in our case, it's just the thing we're moving, right? It's, and it's a wrapper around just the raw element, because so, it does more. Um, so anyway, the library gives us some categories, right? There's ones that are kept since the last time we animated, ones that have just been newly inserted, ones that have been removed. And really all we're doing here is, is trying to apply motions to each sprite, uh, or any sprites we want to do. So uh, I have three, actually no, just one motion here. Move is a, so move is a motion. It's like the most obvious motion, move the thing. Um, and I'm gonna apply a move to each of the kept sprites. And that'd be a good thing just to focus on if we're gonna dive deeper. So what does it mean to apply a move motion? So let's go look at that. Ember animated add-on motions move. All right, and I will make it big. Move is actually a pretty complicated one. Um, the but so the, the pitch, of course, is that uh, it does a lot in a package that should hopefully have a pretty nice boundary, right? Mostly you can use it and not worry about it. Um, and I say it's complicated, it's not like giant, it's like 121 lines of code, uh, like total, like including the white space and the counts. So it's not that big, we can totally focus on it. Um, so when you make a motion, uh, it really can do, it basically has three hooks on it, like it has a constructor, that gets the sprite you're supposed to animate and any options that were passed to you. And there's this optional interrupted hook, and the library is going to call this if there were previous motions running on this sprite when you start mo moving. This is how we do handoff. And that's really the reason this move is, has any kind of complexity in it at all. If it didn't care about interruption, um, it would be very simple, but it also wouldn't do the right thing when you like, uh, here, let me bring in my time controls. Right, as stuff is coming in, if we slow down the time, stuff's coming in, right? We can slow it way down so it's easier to click on. When I click on these, that makes them go out of the list, right? So if one's still coming in and I click on it, right, and I turn time back up, you'll see that there's actually momentum when it goes back out, right? And of course, we didn't see that in our transition code. Like, th this is just very declarative. It doesn't do that. Um, so the, the magic that makes that all work is that this can be very declarative and you just run it again. Anytime somebody's clicking something, this code's running again. It's just applying new moves and the new move is gonna have a new destination because if it's, for example, if it was removed, we're, we sent, we're sending it off the screen to the, off to the edge of the screen. So 
we're, changing, we're making a new move with a new destination. So the move has to deal with interruption. And yes, exactly. So this, this is going to run any time the data changes, right? Right, so that's coming out of the animation component. So in this case, there's an animated each in the template, right? I didn't show that here. Um, I probably have, okay, here's one. This is basically what it's doing, right? So, it's, and it's a pretty much, a, it's a drop-in replacement for regular Ember each, um, much more so than like, say, liquid each. Oh, no, there was no liquid each. Forget I said that. But there was like liquid <laughs> if, now we have animated if, and it's true drop-in replacement. Because um, it doesn't add any DOM, and it should do all the same things. Um, so this is this component is really doing the the work of you know it's got a list coming in and that list is changing we're getting new versions of it and this component is keeping that state internally right so it knows last time you had these three items now you have four items some of them mat overlap some of them don't uh, it's able to actually what it's going to what it's going to yield out into here is actually the superset of all the things that are in, in flight right now It'll get rid of the old ones, but only after they've had a chance to, to animate, if they want to animate. So that's where it's coming from. Um, so, and again, this is this is the this is the layering in action. That all that stuff can happen in terms of just like we just have to characterize all of the sprites in a, at a given point in time when the data is changing. Uh, there's five categories um, because I showed you three here, which happen when you have a single component animating. It turns out components can share sprites across from component to component, and that adds, gives us two, two more categories. Um, but in any case, uh, we just have to declaratively map the categories to motions. And, it, and it's very deliberately declarative so we can run it as many times as we need to, and, and hopefully you still get the right answer without you having to think deeply about all those intermediate cases. Right? Like, what happens if five of them are flying in and then one gets clicked? Right? Like, there's an explosion of possibilities. Yes. It's very similar to what D3 does, yes. If you've seen D3's uh, handling, it has these three categories, right? The, the new stuff, the old stuff, and the kept stuff. Um, very similar. And in fact, uh, so D3 is a great example of declaratively, declarative API just like this one. And um, I would, by the way, I would love for somebody to do like a D3 that's natively all just Glimmer components, because actually I think Glimmer templates are even better at being declarative than JavaScript is, right? Like D3 is weird for people to learn the first time they encounter it, because it's easy to do the wrong thing. like it's easy to think you can just use a value in some place where it doesn't work, because JavaScript lets you do everything you want, and a template has to be declarative. There's no getting away from it. Uh, so somebody should make that. But anyway, the meat of it then comes into uh, animate, and animate is a generator, right? That's has that, why it has that little star on it. So just like an Ember concurrency task is a generator, this follows the same kind of idea. If you yield out a promise that's gonna resolve at some later point, that's gonna basically pause this until it's ready to go more. Um, and so, most of what we're going to do here is uh, look at the sprite we've been given, and it ha it knows it's where it's going where it's starting. Starting, basically, if you click, at the moment you click, the library is measuring where was that sprite. Like that's its initial bound. Right? Um, and then we're also going to measure where does it actually end up at the end of this move. Right. So particularly for the kept sprites, they obviously have an initial place. Maybe they're going to have to move down the list because others are coming in. Right, they all have some destination. So the library is taking care of measuring all that, and it does that by coordinating all the animators. Right? You have to tell them, everybody stop what you're doing, go to your final positions so we can measure what those all mean, because they're all inter affecting each other. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, correct. You have to let the browser lay it out. Um, and I think that uh, it's just, otherwise you end up re-implementing the whole browser layout system and you're not going to get it right, yeah. And so you can do that without people seeing it because um, micro-task scheduling, like the idea that when you say a, when a promise resolves, it's basically guaranteed to happen before a paint. Like if you keep doing promises, you'll never paint. Um, that's actually one of the great benefits of having real micro-task scheduling. I do rely on that in this. If, you don't, if you've got a browser that doesn't have it, too bad. Uh, but most of them do now, right? Like so it's, like you can actually, it works on IE 11 and all that kind of stuff because there's good poly build for it. Um, so anyway, if there's not a prior move, it's actually pretty simple. That's all here. Uh, and so here, this is actually an example of like the next layer down. So motions themselves are generally built on tweens. Right? So tween comes from the idea of uh, going all the way back to hand-drawn cartoon animation. Right? Uh, some 
visionary artist would come up with the key frames of the animation. And they wouldn't be all the intermediate states, right? It would be just like Mickey Mouse over here, Mickey Mouse over there. And then this whole army of other artists would have to have the job of drawing all the intermediate frames to make one move in into the other. And that's called tweening. Uh, and that term kind of moved forward into computer graphics as a way to say, how does some value change from one point to another? How does it get there? Um, so this is an example of a, uh, there's a tween for the X position, there's a tween for the Y position. It starts somewhere, it ends somewhere. Um, it takes a certain amount of time. And fuzzy zero is here because if you're actually moving like a quarter of a pixel, you don't really want to wait around for that. You want it to just in instantly happen, right? Um, and we take an easing function, right, which again, you can almost see that as yet another layer under the tweens. The tweens can take a kind of pure math easing function. That's the idea that, you know, when you generally when you want something, think something to move, you don't want it to suddenly accelerate from zero to 60, right? It should ramp up gracefully. And if it's coming to a stop on screen, it should also slow down gracefully. Easing functions are a way to do that. So we can make an X tween and a Y tween. And uh, I'll skip the interrupting case first to show you the end state which is really that when we come down here to this loop, which is like while the tweens are not done animating, um, translate our sprite. So this is going to apply a CSS transform. Well, it's actually going to take like, the, spr the sprite might have a CSS transform property already, which is in general is a matrix, right? This is going to do a matrix multiplication to move that. Actually, it's just, translation is easy. It's just an adding. But you're going to manipulate the matrix uh, to move it to a new position so that it will be where you want it to be matching the tweens. And yield graph here is something I saw, we saw in the other earlier example. This is just the idea that you're going to wait for the next paint before you do any more. Right. The interruption case is what gives us our momentum. It's a little more complicated, um, but it's not doing anything too crazy. It turns out it doesn't know anything about momentum. Uh, it's using tricks. Uh, a big contrast from what you tend to be doing in a practical application like this and my totally impractical orbital mechanic uh, toy is that um, usually you know where you want to end up and it better end up there, right? Like, you really want the thing to go from here to there, and it, when it lands in its final position, th there's clearly the design it's supposed to be somewhere, right? Um, you're not really doing a simulation where you just, like, let, it, let the chips fall where they may, and it sh shows up somewhere. Um, it's tempting to want to, uh, to do simulation to get physical motion, um, but it's really hard to, like, bend it to go exact to land exactly where you want it to at exactly when you want it to. So here we're doing something much more heuristic, which is we, we find the prior move, and it has tweens also, right? And they have some amount of value still left to go, right? We actually add those tweens to our new tweens and add an offset that compensates for the difference in where you were going and where you are going. What that means is the old tween is going to still be running, but the new tween is rapidly going to ramp up and start to take over and dominate. And so as the old one fades away, the new one's taking over, and it all works out and ends up looking really nice. And, if, and that'll happen, that can happen multiple times in the life of a single sprite, because we're going to keep adding up the tweens, right? And so you'll get back and forth kind of crazy motion. That's really fun. Um, I have, I totally should have one of those. Let's see. Might have to start it up there. I need to deploy all these docs. Sam, we need to deploy the docs state. I'm using Sam's Ember CLI add on docs for the uh, Ember animated site, and it's great. I say I, but other people did most of the work. It was great. Um, so, yeah, so that was the kind of, th so that's a tour of like how you write a motion, right? And in terms of what other motions are here, there's like move is obviously what we just looked at. Um, something like opacity is also a motion. Let me make it big. Um, it has short, there's like shorthand of like opacity is like move me from some arbitrary start to some arbitrary end opacity. Fade in and fade out obviously have like specific meanings. One end is going to be there or not. Um, an opacity sprite, opacity is a simpler one, right? Like, doesn't have to do a lot of fancy things with combining tweens, mostly because you can't really see it. It doesn't really make sense that there's momentum in how much your opacity was changing. It can actually turn on a dime, it doesn't look bad. Um, but we do, if there was a prior one, we do want to start at the value it had so that you don't suddenly like flash into, if the, if the goal was to fade out to nothing, and you were already halfway faded out, and we apply a fade out again, you don't want to like start at full opacity again, right? You want to start at the right place. So there's a little interruption you need, but not as much. And, uh, and this just uses sprite apply styles. Right. This is, and that's like a general purpose way to manipulate the element. The reason we have this API through the sprite for doing it instead of letting you manipulate the element directly is now we can unapply that anytime we need to, 
right? So when you get to the end of the animation, we're going to get rid of it so that you can't mess up the final state of your app if your animation breaks. And uh, it means when we do that whole measurement stuff I mentioned where we, we tell all the sprites to go to their final positions, at that instant in time, we can turn off all of these styles, right? So they're going to go where they need to go. That's the job of the sprites to do that. So the whole sprite layer is another yet another layer down, um, one that needs more documentation for sure. Uh, let's see if I got my demo sprite going. Okay, good. Hey, here's our new doc site. Um, it doesn't have super amount of content yet. Uh, it does have some of the very, like, unstyled but useful for development kind of things. This is an example of moving elements from two lists. And if you keep swapping them, you'll actually see, like, them zooming all around. Right, this is all just that addi addition of tweens I was talking about. Um, another good example of that is this one with direct property animation. It's basically the idea that here we just have a list of things that actually have their own coordinates on them and we want to move to match. Um, and so if I keep clicking, th these guys will just get really confused. Um, but they'll keep trying and eventually land where they need to go. That's all just this tweens adding them. That's the same stuff we saw. It turns out it's way easier than having to actually know, like, what is their momentum? How much acceleration do they need to get to the next place? Um, there's definitely cool, cool things I want to do that is harder. Uh, and again, if anybody else out there loves math, you should totally help solve the problem of, like, planning ahead collision avoidance so that things won't, that you can move a whole bunch of things without them touching. Uh, I started working on that as for a demo for EmberConf. And after a couple of days, I wrote a big note to myself, like, do not work on this anymore until everything else is done, because you're going to sink all your time into it. And it was true. It was, it's a hard problem. Um, surprisingly, there's not like really good literature on it. It seems like something people need. Uh, and people have done it for actual robots, like moving in a factory. Like, how do you get them all to go to the right place? But like, it's not actually a good fit for, I just need it to look plausible. Uh, so yeah, cool. All right, maybe that was enough from me. Are we done? Are we out of time? Am I, are we overstaying our welcome? OK, cool. Another one? Sure. That's OK. Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, no, exactly. Well, yeah, it's correct, yes. And it's because it's, I mean, it is threatening, right? Like, I think I do react viscerally to a proposal for a thing that I think is a bad abstraction um, because it really, because if it becomes that thing that everybody takes for granted, it's like inescapable, right? Like, so it feels, uh, it does involve a loss of some of your autonomy, right? Like you have more control when you do it all completely yourself, right? It's like, uh, you know, this is like, do you join do you join civilization or you do go off and live on a desert island, right? Like, you have to give up a certain amount of your raw animal freedom, right, to just do what you want. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, it's not just technological, it's very, it's a political question, it's an interpersonal question. Do you trust the people proposing the, these abstractions? You know, do you just like politically reject the idea of over handing over a certain piece of power to somebody else? NPM? <laughs> no comment. Uh, yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. All right, so that concludes our formal program for tonight. Um, we are gonna be uh, at WeWork's office on April 4th for that project night that I mentioned. Details on, on uh, Meetup. We're back uh, here 
April 26th. Um, speaker TBD. By that I mean, if you'd like to speak, you should talk to me. <laughs> um, and uh, and then any other project nights. So I know that you know Aaron made mention of um, possibly organizing a contributors workshop. Um, we are definitely open to doing other sorts of community events. So talk to Jorge or I, and um, we'll help you to make that happen if you want to be the one that uh, <coughs> gets the ball rolling. Um, so that's it. Um, some f we generally go across the street to uh, the bar to Croton Reservoir for a drink after this. Um, you should feel free. Um, as a dad with a daughter, I'm not going to do that tonight, but um, I'm sure there will be people going. So thanks, everybody. Thanks to Movable Inc. Thanks to our speakers, um, to Zach, to Aaron, and to Ed. Awesome. <laughs>